Our dinosaur of the day is Dreadnoughtus, which was widely in the news in 2014. And Dreadnoughtus, the name comes from an old English word that means fear nothing. And the actually the full name of the species is Dreadnoughtus Shrani, I believe is how it's pronounced. And that's based on the name of the big battleships in the 1900s and also Adam Schron, who helped fund the research of the species. This dinosaur was so big there was probably nothing that could have attacked it. And it may actually be the biggest dinosaur, at least that we know about so far. Dr. Kenneth Lacavara from Drexel University is the one who discovered Dretnatus, actually during excavations between 2005 and 2009, though it wasn't published and in the news till 2014. He found it in the Cerro Fortaleza Formation in Santa Cruz Province in Patagonia, Argentina. And part of the big news was, uh, in addition to this dinosaur being so big, Dreadnoughtus was also one of the most complete skeletons found. They found about 45% of the skeleton. Uh, most of the bones, like the ribs, were hollow. And having so many of the bones helped scientists determine how this dinosaur lived, its bone strength, how it even helped itself up, as well as how big it was. Yeah, as a side note, we went to the Drexel Museum in Philadelphia, and in their museum they actually have it's called Hattie. Oh, Hattie the dinosaur. Hattie. Ha- the hadrosaur. Yeah, I think it's called Hattie from Haddonfield, New Jersey. It's a hadrosaurus, and it's the first dinosaur skeleton that was ever mounted. It's really neat to see such an early dinosaur, and you can go across the border into New Jersey and see a little plaque where a Boy Scout put up. He, he researched where the dinosaur was actually discovered and nailed down the point and put a little plaque up to show where it is. It's really cool. So Dreadnoughtus was about 85 feet long, 30 feet tall, and weighed about 65 tons. It's equivalent to about 12 elephants or 9 Tyrannosaurus rexes, which is pretty enormous. And it explains why they named it in such a way that it probably feared nothing. Because if you're 9 times the size of the one of the biggest predators... Don't have much to fear. Blue whales still are the largest animals to have lived. They weigh roughly 150 tons, but there have been some discovered that were over 200 tons. And I always think it's kind of an unfair comparison because living in the water, for one thing, they can cool down easier because water transfers heat much easier. But for another thing, if you measure weight in an ocean versus weight on land, it's not the same. So your mass may be, you know, 130,000 kilograms, but your weight isn't 300,000 pounds when you're in the water because the water, the buoyancy of the water actually reduces the weight significantly. So, you know, if you've ever seen a beached whale, you understand that whales can't operate out of water because they're so heavy. One of the craziest things about the Dreadnoughtus skeleton that they found was after analyzing the bones, scientists concluded that this dinosaur was still growing when it died, and it actually probably died at a young age because of a catastrophic flood, so there's no way to know how big this dinosaur could have gotten. Yeah, there's a great TED Talk that we've mentioned before about young dinosaurs that was put on by Jack Horner. And he talks about just how you can tell that in the bone. It basically comes down to the texture of the fossil. So I guess when they cut this open or looked at a broken part of it, they saw that young dinosaur thing. Makes you wonder how big it could have been. So researchers were able to measure the femur and the humerus from the dreadnoughtus. And they consider these two bones to be the gold standard for calculating the mass of a four-legged animal. So when they looked at the... Those two bones, they estimate 65 tons for its weight. And according to Blackavera, no other dinosaur measured that way was as big. So there's the little asterisk there for the measured that way because a lot of people contend that Argentinosaurus and possibly other Titanosaurs were larger. But Argentinosaurus in particular, they had a partial femur. I don't think they ever discovered a humerus. And then it was mostly um, vertebrae that they found. So you can get a, a pretty good estimate at the size of it. But really what you're doing is you're just comparing 
the vertebrae to another vertebrae and you're just assuming that everything's scaled up evenly. So if you have the humerus and the femur, you can actually tell how much weight it was supporting and moving around. So it's a, it's a much better indication. And if you look at the estimates of Argentinosaurus at places that they claim it was the largest dinosaur, there'll be huge variability in the weight. They'll say, oh, it was between 60 and 100 tons. Whereas because we have the accurate measurements of Dreadnoughtus, we say, oh, it was about 65. <laughs> So it gives you some insight into just how much more we know about Dreadnoughtus than some of these other dinosaurs. And because Dreadnoughtus was so big and found in a remote location, it took Lacavara and his team four summers to excavate. That's why 2005 to 2009. And they had to use mules to get, some, uh, to get the bones to a truck. In 2009, they used an ocean freighter to move the skeleton to Philadelphia so they could prepare the fossils and analyze them. And eventually, they're going to move the fossils to the Museo Padre Molina in Rio Gallegos in Argentina. So because of the completeness of the skeleton, scientists also may be able to model Dreadnoughtus' breathing, figure out its blood pressure, and they've already estimated about how much food it could eat, roughly half a ton a day or a thousand pounds. They also may determine the proportions and shapes of the giant sauropods, Dreadnoughtus had a shorter, more muscular tail, about 30 feet long, and a longer neck than they expected. The neck was about 37 feet long. This probably allowed the dinosaur to stand in one place to eat, which would have been important because it, since it, as Garrett said, it had to eat half a ton of food every day. So scientists also found a single cylindrical tooth from the Dreadnoughtus, and it was about an inch long. Dreadnoughtus had rows of these teeth, and with these types of teeth... Dreadnoughtus would have used them to strip vegetation from branches and plants rather than chewing them. We talked earlier about teeth batteries and how you use those to chew, but these peg-like teeth is what you use to strip. Um, Lacovera said that their stomachs were larger than a draft horse. Which is a type of horse specifically used for farming, um, so they're very big, and sometimes they're called gentle giants. So uh, the stomach was so big you could fit a whole horse in it, which is just crazy. And because it was so big and they were taking in a thousand pounds of food a day. Without chewing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they figure that the food probably st sat in their stomachs for up to months before being fully digested. Dreadnoughtus had longer forearms than other titanosaurs, which is the group it's in. But they weren't much longer than its hind limbs. So it probably held its head pretty close to horizontal. And it strikes me as interesting compared to, we were talking about Spinosaurus the other day and how it had short forelimbs and that made it easier for it to, you know, skim off the top of water. So it seems like Dreadnoughtus probably would have left its head a little higher up, closer to its full height. So it would be stripping off the plants at that height rather than grazing like a cow kind of thing. Dreadnoughtus' tail had some very unique characteristics. Uh, for example, the first vertebrae had a ridge on its ventral surface called a keel, and part of its respiratory system was in the bases of the neural spines in the first third of the tail. It had uh, cavities that were probably caused from contact with air sacs. And according to Lacavera, the body weight of modern animals correlates to internal body temperature, but at 65 tons, the body temperature would actually be much higher than the temperature that cooks meat. So these air sacs probably helped Dreadnoughtus fan themselves on the inside. Yeah, sometimes people talk anecdotally about birds or dinosaurs being cold-blooded, but that has to do with the metabolism of the animal, and it doesn't actually have to do with the literal temperature. With anything that big and moving at all, the energy being produced inside and all that insulation from all the meat and fat and everything would really heat up the animal. So it's pretty fascinating to think about the ways that it would cool down. These air sacs are definitely one way. And also the long neck and the long tail would have helped it regulate its body temperature. I kind of think of them as like fins on a heat sink or a radiator, I guess, sticking out there, helping to cool it down. Another way to put that is that it had more surface area per volume when it had the long neck and the long tail 
than it would have otherwise. So a couple other things about Dreadnoughtus's tail. Its neural spines had distinct ridges. And like modern animals with tails like crocodiles, Dreadnoughtus had bones below its vertebrae called chevrons. And these bones connected in a Y shape. One of the coolest things about Dreadnoughtus, the study of Dreadnoughtus, is that Lacavera and his team made laser scans of all the bones found, and they used 3D imagery to figure out how the dinosaur moved, and they used 3D printers to create models at a one-tenth scale, and all of these 3D scans are available for free as PDF files on Figshare, and we'll share the link at our website, I Know Dino, when we post the transcript of this episode. I need to see these models. If they're one-tenth scale, that still means they're almost ten feet long. be a pretty cool dinosaur. Maybe we need to get a 3D printer just so we can <laughs> print some dinosaur replicas. That's a pretty cool idea. So Titanosaurians are the group that Dreadnoughtus is in, and it's the group of very large sauropods. They were huge herbivores that lived during the last 30 million years of the Mesozoic era, or to put it another way, at the end of the Cretaceous. Some titanosaur species are the largest land-living animals ever discovered, but in many cases scientists have only found incomplete fossils like Argentinosaurus that we mentioned earlier. So you may have guessed the name titanosaur comes from the titans of ancient Greek mythology. Uh, The family Titanosauridae was named after the species Titanosaurus, which was based on an incomplete fossil. They actually only had a partial femur and two incomplete caudal vertebrae found by Richard Lidecker in 1877, but understandably, some scientists say that's not enough information for Titanosauridae to be a genus. So Titanosaurs were a group of sauropods that lived about 90 to 66 million years ago, and they were dominant herbivores. They replaced other sauropods like Diplodocids and Brachiosaurids, and sometimes I'll look back at some of my favorite dinosaurs and wonder why were they only around for, you know, two, five, ten million years when the length of dinosaurs on Earth was so much longer. And it's because they were continually evolving and newer species would replace them. So really, these titanosaurs were the epitome of evolution in large herbivorous dinosaurs. Titanosaur fossils have been found in all continents, including Antarctica, although Antarctica at the time wasn't where it is now. And in fact, most of the titanosaurs that have been found were found in the southern continents, which at the time was part of the supercontinent Gondwana. And that includes Argentina, which is where Argentinosaurus and Dreadnoughtus were found. Compared to other sauropods, titanosaurs had small heads, but their heads were also wide, and they had large nostrils and crests formed by nasal bones. And titanosaurs had spoon-like or peg or pencil-like teeth that were very small, but they were not at all picky eaters. They actually had a very broad diet that included cycads and conifers, as well as, more surprisingly, uh, palms and grasses, which included the ancestors of rice and bamboo. And this is just more evidence that dinosaurs and grasses evolved together, as we uh, discussed in the news in the last episode, dinosaurs that probably ate hallucinogenic fungus. So titanosaurs tended to have average length necks, at least as far as sauropods are concerned, which is a pretty long neck, and whip-like tails, but their tails weren't as long as diplodocids, and they had smaller pelvises compared to other sauropods. But they did have wider chests, which gave them a broader stance, and also made them more stocky, but their forelimbs were longer than their hind limbs, and they had solid backbones instead of hollowed-out backbones. They also had a more flexible spinal column, so they could probably move a little better and possibly even rear up. Scientists have found from skin impressions that titanosaurs had small bead-like scales around larger scales, and one species, Saltosaurus, even had bony plates like an ankylosaurus. Some titanosaurs may have used their osteoderms to store minerals during droughts. 